Now, Harry Wills is best known for being the fighter that Jack Dempsey avoided during his title reign. Now, aside from Gene Tunney, Wills was the best contender that Dempsey could have faced during his tenure as champion. But the fight would never happen because of Dempsey's promoter, Tex Rickard, who feared that Wills could beat his man, and the powers that be did not want another Jack Johnson on their hands. But Wills was the polar opposite of Johnson in temperament. A quiet man, he grew up in poverty in New Orleans in the late 1800s, and he grew to a height of some report of 6'2", some report him as being as tall as 6'4", and he usually weighed about a little over 200 pounds. This was a gargantuan sized heavyweight back in the early 1900s, and he started his career in 1910. Four years later, he was matched with the veteran Sam Langford, who knocked him out in 14 rounds. Uh, Wills was worn down by the more experienced Langford, but still managed to knock down Langford four times. A month later, he would lose to another notable of the time period, Sam McVeigh, who outworked him en route to a 20 rounds point win. But Wills would remain undaunted. He would fight the great Sam Langford a total of 22 times, and for the most part, he had Langford's number. Two of the more notable fights would take place in 1916, and in about of uh, February of that year, Wills was knocked out by Langford in a fight of the year brawl. Uh, he would not only lose the fight, but also his fiancee, Edna Jones, as the two were scheduled to be married after the fight. But uh, Miss Edna became so distraught upon Wills losing that she committed suicide. Uh, she was convinced that Wills' career was going nowhere. And six years later, her assessment seemed to be prophetic. After nine years in the game, Wills had yet to secure a title shot. Uh, Dempsey had been champion for over a year and was content to take on the white contenders and tour the country with his uh, famous actress wife, Estelle Taylor. Wills, meanwhile, was uh, stuck in obscurity. He was frustrated and ready to retire until he met a manager named Patty Mullins. Now, Mullins would convince promoters that Wills could sell tickets. It took the Black Panther out of low-rent arenas where only black fighters faced each other, and he showcased Wills to a larger audience. A mythical world-colored heavyweight championship title was created, and Wills would defeat Sam Langford for the belt, which was studded with diamonds, rubies, and gold, but Langford had pawned off the gold from the belt and gave Wills the pawn ticket in addition to the belt. But Wills and Mullins wanted the real belt that Dempsey held, so they sought out the number one contender, the six foot five inch Fred Fulton. Wills would be the underdog, but he took out Fulton in three rounds. The following years would see Wills' reputation grow as he would defend his colored heavyweight title over 26 times. Now because of this, the boxing public began calling for a Dempsey-Wills fight. Dempsey was criticized for not only avoiding Wills, but also criticized for failing to serve in the military during World War I. Both Wills and Dempsey wanted the fight, but there was one all-important man who didn't, and that was Dempsey's promoter, Tex Rickard. Now during this time, Rickard was the most powerful man in boxing. He had promoted the first million dollar match in uh, Dempsey versus George Campantier, and he also promoted Jack Johnson against uh, James J. Jeffries. So when Johnson destroyed Jeffries in that match, race riots broke out across the country, and Rickard had made it a point to never again put up what he described as a mixed match. So Rickard instead opted to put Dempsey in with the Argentine Luis Firpo, which resulted in uh, restoring some of uh, Dempsey's dwindling reputation. But Wills' manager went to court in order to try and keep the match from happening. He protested that it should have been Wills in there instead of Firpo, but Mullins' attempts were unsuccessful. Now Dempsey would take out Firpo, but not before being knocked out of the ring himself. Now, Mullins decided to put Wills in against Firpo, and if Wills beat Firpo more impressively than Dempsey, he could then demand a title shot. But Wills was now 35 years old, and he wasn't able to stop Firpo. He clearly outpointed Firpo, but under New Jersey law during that time, no decision was rendered. Uh, most observers thought that Wills should have won a lopsided decision. He floored Firpo in the second, but then eased up on his opponent. Mullins instructed Wills that he wanted him to look good, but not too good, in order not to scare off Tex Rickard. Now, after Wills' bout with Firpo, a match with Dempsey was signed. Dempsey himself pressed for the fight, and contracts were signed for them to face each other on July 4th, 1925. Now, Wills was now 36 years old. Uh, Dempsey himself was 30, uh, but he had not fought in two years. Uh, Wills was given a, a $50,000 signing bonus, but the fight never happened. Uh, Wills' fans claimed that Dempsey was afraid 
and were angered that their man was cheated out of the chance to fight for the title. What happened was Rickard killed the match by pricing Dempsey out of the fight. He demanded too high of a guaranteed payment, and he allowed Wills to keep the $50,000, which led people to believe that Dempsey had paid off Wills. Rickard instead had someone else in mind to face Dempsey, Gene Tunney, a clean-cut Marine who was on the rise and the boxing world was stunned to see him upset Jack Dempsey over 10 rounds. Now only two weeks later, the 37-year-old Wills was put in with the young Jack Sharkey. Wills' old rival, Sam Lankford, helped train Sharkey and gave him all the tips he needed to batter the aging Wills over 13 rounds before the referee disqualified the Black Panther for holding. It was a humiliating loss for Wills, and it ended whatever interest the public had in him. By 1927, Wills was 38 years old, and he was knocked out by the powerful Spaniard Paulino Uscudin. Wills would have a handful of fights beyond that before retiring in 1932 at the age of 43. His story doesn't end tragically, however, as he would go on to become a prominent real estate investor in Harlem, New York. In his later years, he would go on a one-month fast every February, but he would die in 1958 at age 69 due to diabetes. Forty-five seconds. If the golden numbers on the clock had clicked down forty-five more seconds, Big John Tate would have retained his WBA heavyweight title. He would have made over $3.5 million fighting an aged Muhammad Ali, who in 1980 was ripe for a defeat. All Tate had to do was last another forty-five seconds. The story of Big John Tate begins in West Memphis, Arkansas. Growing up in poverty, Tate would leave school in the seventh grade. He did not know how to read or write and worked the cotton fields of Arkansas. By the age of 14, he was traveling by himself to upstate New York to work in the apple fields. When the fruit season was over, he would move back down south and labor in the lumber yards where his hands would freeze in the harsh cold because he could not afford work gloves. But throwing around the heavy pieces of wood would develop Big John's physique. By the age of 18, he had grown to six foot four and had well over 200 pounds of lean muscle. He would move to Knoxville, Tennessee, and by happenstance take up the sport of boxing. Now employed as a janitor at the local jail, Tate would ascend the amateur ranks, reaching the finals of the state Golden Gloves tournament with limited training. Afterward, Tate was so impressed with the skills of his opponent that he asked him who his coach was. His opponent pointed at Ace Miller. From there, a partnership was formed that would take the two further than they ever could have imagined. Ace Miller was a jack-of-all-trades and the hustler of everything he did. Not only was he a boxing trainer and manager, he was a newspaper machinist, a motel manager, and a gas station attendant. Boxing trainer, Ace Miller. I'm a dictator. This is a nasty business, and you got to be mean a lot of the time. But I'll be mean. I want my father to love me and love everybody else except his opponent. I'll take all the flack. Miller and Tate's paths would merge, and they would become the perfect match. Miller would analyze and set the game plan. Tate would be the relentless executor. His muscles finally had a worthy purpose and a home. Boxer John Tate. I like to hunt and fish and shoot guns and drive around. The same people, that, the same as these people. I, Knoxville is not too fast for me. It's just right for John Tate. I've lived in big cities where you need tokens to get on the subway and you've got to know what street to get off. Here I can ride my 10-speed bike. These people are different. I'm a quiet man. I'm not a person who makes the news. I'm not down in my own race, you understand, but there are people who think I'm too easy going too mild. I don't do a lot of bad things, and Knoxville is my kind of town. Tate would learn the nuances of the boxing game from Miller, becoming a more well-rounded fighter. He would defeat such stellar amateurs as Marvin Stinson, Greg Page, and Michael Dokes, all of whom had more experience than he did. In defeating these men, he would earn a place on the celebrated 1976 U.S. Olympic team. 
he would reach the semifinals before being stopped by the vastly more experienced Teofilo Stevenson. Turning pro with an Olympic bronze medal on his resume and Ace Miller by his side, he would begin a meteoric rise to the top, match tough from the beginning. In only his fifth pro bout, he would decision contender Eddie Animal Lopez. Tate would go on to stop the hard-hitting Bernardo Mercado in his Madison Square debut, and then decision the slick Johnny Boudreau, all then running his record to a perfect 15-0. His coming out party would be against the experienced Dwayne Bobbick on national television. Bobbick's fight plan is not being followed. He was going to fall inside and body punch. But the great offense is the best defense. Now, we're less than a minute to go in round one. Bobbick has been down once already and catching the punches. The feathers in the cap of Tate were accumulating, who would be lauded by promoter Bob Arum as the next great heavyweight champion. Some boxing writers called him a mirror image of George Foreman, a huge heavyweight leaving behind a trail of carnage. Tate himself felt as if he traveled to another planet. He was no longer the invisible boy toiling in the hot cotton fields of Arkansas. He was two fights away from becoming heavyweight champion of the world. Now a top-ranked contender, Tate would be part of a four-man tournament in South Africa to compete for Muhammad Ali's now vacated WBA heavyweight title. He would defeat Kali Kanotsi to advance against Harry Kotsia, who had demolished Leon Spinks in only one round. Tate would then become the hope of the black community in the apartheid South Africa. Ironically, he found little support from the black community in Knoxville. John Tate I can go to a black school and kids say, you, you ain't so special. I can go into a white school and kids say, here's John Tate. The John Tate-Harry Kotsia battle for the WBA heavyweight crown was South Africa's version of the rematch of Joe Lewis and Max Schmeling. In the land of apartheid, the fight would be the first integrated sporting event in the country's history. Over 86,000 spectators arrived with over 2,000 armed militia around the stadium with 100 attack dogs in tow. There was enough tension in the ring that night to make the air crackle. Carrying the hopes of every black South African on his shoulders, Tate's will to win would be impervious. In the third round, it appeared that his shaky chin would crack as Kotsia would catch him with his vaunted bionic right cross, a nickname given to his signature punch because his hand had been surgically repaired. Tate buckled but remained upright and punched back, his own blows becoming harder than Concia's. Tate began to display the qualities that would earn him the right to be called champion. Writers would point to his size and right-hand power, but Tate's greatest strength was his ability to control the pace of a fight. When landing his jab with laser-like accuracy, he would lean on his opponents and smother their counterattack. His strategy proved too much for Concia to handle. Ace Miller Tate won a 15-round decision. The crowd went silent when the decision was announced, and we had no problems. We, we stayed for a few, we stayed for three days after the fight, and people treated us fine. Tate was now on top of the boxing world. Muhammad Ali made it known that he was coming back, and he wanted to win the heavyweight title for a fourth time. Tate, along with Larry Holmes, was mentioned as a possible opponent. But trouble was brewing on the horizon. Ace Miller. John was absolutely idolized here in Knoxville. Once he got involved with drugs, however, he went downhill fast. Beating Kotsia meant a lot to the people of South Africa, but it also meant a lot to the people here. Uh, John Tate was one of the biggest things that ever happened here. Everybody wanted him at the house or the party every night after he won the title. As Tate's wallet grew fatter, so did his waistline. He would then be scheduled to face an opponent who now looked to be the polar opposite of himself in discipline and popularity. A little-known muscular contender named Mike Hercules Weaver, Ace Miller. I didn't want that fight. We were supposed to fight Ron Lyle, but he took a fight with Lynn Ball and got knocked out. I knew Weaver had a real good left hook. We were more or less forced into that fight. Tate was sick for 15 days in the beginning of March. The fight was scheduled for March 31st. But the match went as expected. Weaver was tough and rocked Tate on a few occasions, but Big John held strong and had a comfortable lead on all three judges' scorecards going into the 15th and final round. So far, I haven't exactly seen where. That's an overhand right high on the side of Tate's head by Weaver. 
guess Mike Snow's bleeding a little bit. Maybe what it is. Left hook. Clayton goes down in his face. Weaver hit him with a left hook. And Clayton is down. Go. He is just beginning to move. The fight is over. Weaver has knocked him out in the 15th round. With less than a minute to go in the 15th round, Weaver knocked him cold. Tate laid motionless on the canvas for several minutes. Blood dripped out of his ear. The Knoxville crowd watched on in stunned silence. John Tate, it wasn't one punch. You got to look at what happened through the 15 rounds. Weaver got me with low blows in the 3rd, the 11th, and the 4th. I was winning on points, but I was taking a beating too. I was tired and I got stunned. I lost that fight. It wasn't brain damage or anything like that. In a matter of seconds, the championship reign of John Tate was over. The adulation, the pats on the back, the roar of the crowd, over. John Tate wanted it all back, and fast. The primal thrill of being heavyweight champion of the world had become a necessity. He missed the respect of people of all colors. Ace Miller. T Tate needed the money and I wanted to return to the top too quick. We all made a hasty decision, and a wrong one with Burbick. In the meantime, here is the ex-heavyweight champion of the world, John Tate, who lost by a shocking fight, a shocking knockout by Weaver, who I think he was about as comfortably ahead as I've ever seen any champion in any heavyweight fight that I've ever seen and lose at the very end. He was so far ahead, it would have taken what he got, and a spectacular lucky shot by Mike Weaver. You're a good man to ask this, Bertie. How does it affect his psyche? That's what we're going to we're gonna find out today. That is exactly what we're going to find out today. He seems to be in good shape. He seems to be ready to go. And, you know, he's, he's with a terrific group of people. They're all from the amateur program in Knoxville. They have come along together since this guy was a little baby. And they have a family unit. Ace Miller, all of these guys from Knoxville work together. Now, Big John Tate is... Up for his first fighters. test right now. If he can get Both past this test, he goes to the next nighttime fight, maybe August the 1st, against Animal Lopez, and then we will know whether he is back in the title picture or not. The fight was a toss up going into the ninth round. Ace Miller. I can't blame anybody but myself. We got up to Montreal, and John lost a ton of weight, down to 217 at one point. I kept telling him, don't get, get mean. But he didn't get mean. They, they treated us like dirt down there, They're making John work out early or late. I've had people like Angelo Dundee criticize me for putting John on a card with other fighters so soon after being champion, and they're right. My first instinct was to scratch the whole thing, but I didn't. Tate found himself on the canvas, the knockout almost an exact replica of his fateful night against Weaver. He went down hard. His legs twitched. Ace Miller. I was scared. I wasn't scared when Mike Weaver knocked out John, but when somebody like Trevor Burbick hits John twice in the back of the head, that scared me a lot. Tate's personal doctor, Robert Whittle. John was heartbroken, afraid. He let everybody down. He cried and cried, but the only injury he had was a small cut near his left eye. I checked his vital signs, observed him overnight, and saw him when we got back the next day. Dr. Whittle advised Tate to go on a six-month hiatus. The now ex-champion spent these months fishing, wild boar hunting, getting married, and buying a house. His trainer, Ace Miller, on the other hand, suffered a tragic loss when his oldest daughter was killed in a car accident. Miller and Tate would reunite and attempt to rekindle their early success. But Miller could see that Tate was slipping away. Tate would remain semi-active in the business, fighting nondescript opposition for the next seven years, all the while battling a cocaine habit. During his few appearances on ESPN, his pre-fight bio piece always showed his last round knockout defeat to Mike Weaver as the centerpiece. A fate that Tate would never escape. John Tate. Everywhere I went, it tormented me the way I lost to him. I guess it will always torment me. Tate would gain a significant amount of weight over the years until by 1987 he would tip the scales at nearly 300 pounds. His final fight would be against Noel Corliss, 
which he weighed 280 pounds, a bloated cartoon version of his former self. He would retire at age 33 with career earnings of over $1.7 million, but by 1989, all of his property would be auctioned off to pay off his debts. Tate's drug habit became so bad that he became a beggar in the streets. He robbed a man of $14 at a Knoxville homeless shelter, breaking his victim's jaw. John Tate. He just kept teasing me about the Weaver fight all day and all night. I admit I broke the boy's jaw, but I didn't rob him. That's important for people to know. I never robbed anybody. Tate would turn back to God, seeking answers in Knoxville churches, his psyche now becoming more fragile by the day. His reputation as a former heavyweight champion now seemed to work against him, and his only redemption could be found in the ring, a hope now long gone. Church member Tom Brooks. Uh, Tate loved kids, but even they turned on him. They, they'd ask, are you John Tate? And they would drop to the ground and pretend they were knocked out. Tate would smile, but you could tell it hurt him. John Tate. I ain't been no angel, but it got to where they were arresting me for spitting on the sidewalk. And being involved with drugs made me do some crazy things. Uh, I was a junkie, a powerless junkie. I spent more money than most people ever make. But now I got something in my life that nobody can ever take away from me. God. But the church going couldn't save Tate from his downward spiral. He would be arrested for public drunkenness, drug possession, selling cocaine, and stealing cinder blocks from a supermarket. During his prison term, Tate would officially become defeated by life. After serving 28 months, Tate emerged from his incarceration weighing over 400 pounds. The rarefied air of a heavyweight champion now long disappeared from his life, replaced by the rotten stench of drugs, booze, and failure. Ace Miller. I heard that 10 kids jumped on Tate in a pool hall and beat him up for stealing some drugs. He was on a hit list for some low-level drug dealers. I'm surprised he lasted as long as he did on the streets. Tate's end would not come at the hands of drug dealers. In April of 1998, he would crash his truck into a utility pole and flip over. It was later determined that he suffered a massive stroke caused by a brain tumor while driving. Tate was 43 years old. Tate's life had taken a wrong turn right after that final round against Mike Weaver. A life that had become filled with admiration and adulation by his own hard work had now been quickly replaced by pity and thoughts of what could have been if he only held on for another 45 seconds. Wait!